It began with the discovery of a woman's bones in bushland south of Sydney. For five years, she remained anonymous. Police had gone to the end of the earth to try and figure out who she was. In a suitcase found by the side of a remote highway, more bones, this time an infant girl. The girl in the suitcase was actually linked to the woman in Belangelo, Candelise, and her mother, Carly P. Stevenson. Murdered by one of the most evil monsters Australia has known. The obvious suspect was Daniel Holder, and it always felt like there was a larger story to be told there. Carly Pierce Stevenson and, and her daughter Candelise. So this was a story that you've had a huge involvement with, so much so that you wrote a book which I imagine has taken up quite a large chunk of your life. Tell me how you've lived and breathed this story and, and what happened to the mother and daughter. Well, I was reporting at the time, just daily reporting, um, and I re vaguely remembered this cold case from Blangelo State Forest, which is just south of Sydney. And it was a woman's remains, her bones, that were found in the forest in 2010. And police had gone to the end of the earth to try and figure out who she was, DNA and all kinds of other forensic technology, uh, and they couldn't figure it out. So she was Jane Doe, essentially. There was also a T-shirt found next to her remains that had the word angelic on it. So she was known as Angel. And then um, it was 2015. There was a massive case in South Australia involving a young girl's body that was found in a suitcase on the side of a rural highway. Similar circumstances. Police could not figure out who it was. You know, there were no missing person reports that matched the circumstances of this little girl and how she was found and when she was found. And then I remember being in the newsroom one day and there was this very cryptic media advisory that came out from New South Wales Police saying it's going to be a major announcement and an identical alert went out in South Australia. And we're all standing around going, what could this possibly be? Usually they include details, you know, what case they're going to talk about. But this was very vague. You sort of know that it's going to be massive. And then we got to Parramatta and they revealed that well, the girl in the suitcase was actually linked to the woman in Belangelo. So just to put things in a bit of context, these remains had been found five years apart, 1,200 kilometres apart in different states. Yet through this amazing police work, they managed to figure out that the girl in the suitcase in South Australia was Candelise and her mother was Carly P. Stevenson and she was the girl in Belangelo. The little girl's been identified now as Candelise Kiara Pierce. It's actually a double breakthrough in that we've also been able to identify that the human remains found in 2010 in the Belangelo State Forest uh, that of her mother, Kiara. So in South Australia, when the police were trying to figure out who this little girl in the suitcase was, they said that she had been murdered, but they wouldn't reveal how they knew that. But there was also a lot of clothing and different items found in the suitcase. They were really tattered and dirty, but they started releasing some photographs of the clothing. Most of it was from you know, Cotton On or Kmart, so it was mass produced. They didn't have much luck sort of hunting that down getting any leads off that. But then they released a photograph of this quilt and it was really unique. You know, you could tell it was handmade. The family of Candelise were watching the news and they noticed the blanket and they thought, okay, that looks really familiar. And they went through some old photographs and then found a photograph of Candelise sitting in a pram with a pink dress on that was pinstriped. That was also similar to some clothing that was found in the suitcase. And that quilt was behind her head. And the quilt had been made by her grandmother and given to her for Christmas or, or her birthday. So this is about uh, four, se several months after the, um, the body was found. For a bit of background information, Carly and Kennelly's grew up in Alice Springs in the Northern Territory. And in around 2008, Carly left town with her daughter and a man called Daniel Holdham. She said goodbye to her mum and a family friend, and they were a bit sceptical of Daniel, but you know, Carly was sort of old enough to make calls on her life and they had to let her go do her thing. She went down to Adelaide, where she saw her friend in late 2008, and that was sort of the last sighting of her. And then we now know that she went to Canberra. When her family hadn't heard from her in several months, her mum, Colleen, put in a missing persons report and the police um, followed up on that. And there's a little bit of conjecture about 
why I didn't go anywhere. Essentially, the police said that it was followed up on and they got confirmation that Carly was still alive, so they didn't need to go on with the investigation any further. But Colleen, Carly's mother, believed that the case was closed because someone had called Daniel Holdham and said, do you know where Carly is? Or had been to his house and a woman pretending to be Carly said, yes, I'm Carly, I'm alive, I just don't want to talk to my family or I don't want to be found. So the case, the missing persons investigation didn't go any further. Also complicating things was Carly's bank cards were still being used and her Centrelink payments were still being collected. So it looked as if she was still accessing her bank accounts. Fast forward to a few years later, there were also some reports that Carly's mum had received um, phone calls from someone she thought was Carly talking about, oh, mum, you know, I'm, I'm in some trouble here. Can you please wire me $500? I'm going to come home, I promise. Like, I'm going to come home now. One of the most heartbreaking elements of the story was at the time, Colleen was uh, suffering breast cancer and she was undergoing treatment in Adelaide. Colleen always held that hope that her daughter was going to come home. So she would never say, you know, I've wired you enough money. It's not going to happen. Like, she, she would always do it hoping that this is the last time, you know, Carly's going to come home. Colleen ended up passing away um, without knowing what happened to um, her daughter or her granddaughter. Fast forward to 2015 when police had linked the cases together. The obvious suspect who was thrown up was Daniel Holder because they'd gone back and spoken to Carly's friends and her family and said, you know, who was she last seen with? A lot of people threw up this name, Daniel Holder. Then they looked him up and figured out that he was in jail in New South Wales at the time for sexually assaulting a young girl at a caravan park. So that was sort of helpful for them, that he was out of sight and out of mind. They didn't have to worry about him taking with um, or interfering with witnesses or anything. They can go about and do their thing. And they ended up carrying out these this widespread operation across multiple states and all these different search warrants at different places he had lived. And for a case that was, you know, by this point, like, eight or ten years old the amount of forensic evidence they got was amazing so in this place that he lived at in Canberra they found all these really disturbing diary entries where he essentially fantasized about child sexual abuse um, and other very sickening things and they managed to pull his fingerprints off it. Hazel Passmore arrived here to speak with major crime detectives. She spent more than four hours being questioned by detectives on Friday but was released without charge. Miss Passmore is the ex-girlfriend of Daniel Holdham who's been charged with Carly Pierce Stevenson's murder. One of the raids that the police did was on his ex-girlfriend house, a woman named Hazel Passmore. Now Hazel Passmore and Daniel were together for a few years and before he got together with Carly, he was actually involved in a fatal car accident with Hazel and two of her children died and she ended up in a wheelchair because of the injury she suffered from that crash and Daniel was behind the wheel at the time. And it was when she was in hospital undergoing rehab that he ended up in a relationship with Carly and Hazel hated that, you know, she resented Carly, she resented Daniel for leaving her. So it was a very complicated relationship and police raided their house and they spoke to her and her first interview that she spoke about, she didn't, she alluded to little bits and pieces that she knew, um, but she wasn't completely forthcoming and she did a second interview, but only after she, you know, lawyered up essentially and agreed to an induced statement. So that means that whatever she told the police couldn't be used against her to then charge her. And she essentially spoke about how Daniel admitted to her at one point that he had killed Carly, but she didn't. She thought he was joking or didn't act on it. And she was actually implicit with Daniel in taking money out of Carly's bank account after she was dead. And she actually went into Centrelink pretending to be Carly so she could get a back payment on um, some sort of Centrelink payments. So that was really, really disturbing, the fact that they sort of carried out this fraud in Carly's name years after she was murdered. And... Also, when they were carrying out these raids, Hazel's sister saw this on the news and walked into a random police station with a photo SD card and said, you yeah, know, I think you need to have a look at this. And on that photo SD card were these images that Daniel had taken of Carly's body in the Belanglo State Forest. And he had robbed her of, uh, you know, her dignity in the end in the most horrific way. Hazel had given that SD card to her sister saying if anything ever happens to me take this to the police 
So years after this murder, police end up with these photographs that essentially put Daniel by matching, um, having a look at his arm and how it compared to Daniel's arm, the arm in the photograph, putting Daniel at the scene of the crime and Carly in the angelic t-shirt I mentioned earlier at the Langalo State Forest, which was a massive key piece of evidence. And they managed to put together the case in that Carly and Daniel went to Canberra in late 2008 with Candelise. And for some reason or another, they went to Blanglo State Forest. Daniel's murdered Carly there and that he's returned to Canberra to pick up Candelise, told his family that he was going to drop her at her grandmother's place in Adelaide, but drove to Narandra in Western New South Wales and murdered Candelise in that town and put her body in a suitcase and essentially dumped it on the side of a highway and then continued driving to Adelaide back to Hazel, his ex-girlfriend's house. They managed to uh, get the check-in receipt that Daniel had signed when he checked into a motel in Narandra. And he had handwritten on the receipt his name and that he was checking in with one adult and one child, which I thought was just so ironic because he had spent his life lying and deceiving people and committing frauds. And the one time that he actually tells the truth is when the one time that it actually mattered. Did anything ever come out about what had motivated his crimes? He never actually said why, why he did it. Even though he pleaded guilty at the last minute before his trial to both the murder of Carly and Candelise, when he was being sentenced, he tried to change his plea to Candelise's murder and backtrack. And that was sort of a theme throughout this case. He was constantly trying to delay things. You know, it, it just felt like he was constantly scheming and trying to figure out a way to delay the inevitable. There was one interview that he did with a forensic psychologist where he essentially admitted to killing Carly, but you know, he didn't really elaborate on it. He didn't sit down with homicide detectives and, and go through it. And even if he did, he had a record of being deceitful and being a liar. And it was difficult to believe what he said because there were so many, so many different versions. It was quite interesting to get an insight into his background. A lot of people have really rough upbringings uh, and very traumatic childhoods and they go on to live law-abiding, um, successful lives. I don't think this is any justification what he did, but he had a absolutely terrible upbringing. He was abused and he was sort of in and out of foster homes and bouncing around, staying with relatives. And he got the sense that no one really wanted to deal with him, to care for him. He started drinking and taking drugs at quite a young age and then just sort of embarked on this life of crime and destruction. And you know, it just seemed like he, he caused so much harm to so many people throughout his life. But now he's in jail for, he received a life sentence for that, those murders. 